Bonjour, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Hearing that Emmanuel had difficulty giving her lecture en français, I think you definitely want me en anglais. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm embarrassed to say that I studied French for five years in school um, and uh, <laughs> to no avail. I need to come back to France. In any event, uh, it's, it's a great honor to be here and a delight to be here with my colleague, Emmanuel Charpentier. So you heard from her a terrific introduction to the biology of CRISPR systems and the work that led to the ability to harness this technology, this uh, system as a new technology. So I'm gonna very briefly uh, tell you about the work that we did together and, uh, and, and then I want to say a little bit about how the system actually works mechanistically and how we're thinking about using it in the future as well as the ethical implications of this technology. So for, for, I think the story really starts with, with this question. What if scientists had a technology for editing the DNA of cells in a very precise fashion, so specific that you could make a change in a single letter of the DNA code of the human genome, for example? This is an idea that sounds like science fiction. Scientists have been thinking about this ever since the discovery of the structure of DNA in, 19, in the 1950s. And uh, what I'm here uh, to tell you about, and as you heard from Emmanuel, a technology for doing this came about not through a focused effort to discover it, but actually through a curiosity-driven research project aimed at figuring out how bacteria fight viral infection. So in my own lab, about 10 years ago, Jill Banfield, a colleague of mine at UC Berkeley and a laureate of the L'Oreal UNESCO uh, Prize herself, told me about repetitive DNA sequences that she and a few people, few others around the world at the time, were discovering in bacterial genomes. And these sequences, as you heard from Emmanuel, include short segments of repeated sequence, these black diamonds, that flank sequences uh, that come from viruses, the viruses that infect these bacteria. And this locus called CRISPR creates a, a genetic record of the viral infections that these organisms have experienced over many generations. Together with CRISPR-associated or Cas genes that are located typically nearby in the genome, this constitutes a, a pathway of adaptive bacterial immunity. And what we now understand, based on research in a number of labs and, and uh, that we actually started working on back when Jill Banfield uh, first told me about these, is that the way these systems operate is to detect foreign DNA that gets into the cell. I'm showing it here as a, a virus that's infecting a bacterial cell. And that foreign DNA can be detected and uh, integrated in little pieces into the CRISPR locus in the bacterial genome. And then, and this is where sort of my lab uh, got involved in this, in this story, these sequences are transcribed into RNA molecules that provide the sequencing information, the targeting information, for CRISPR-associated or, or, or Cas proteins encoded in the genes nearby in the genomic uh, locus in the bacterium. And so together, these protein RNA complexes use the sequence in the RNA derived originally from a virus and target DNA molecules that have base pairing complementarity to the RNA guide. And that allows the proteins associated in these complexes to cleave foreign DNA and lead to its destruction. And so it was our, our work uh, originally on, on sort of this central part of the pathway that led me to attend a conference in 2011 where Emmanuel and I uh, uh, got acquainted and we decided to work together to determine the function of one Cas gene, Cas9, that had been identified genetically to be critical for adaptive immunity in certain kinds of bacteria, including the bacterium that her laboratory was studying, Streptococcus uh, pyogenes. And that research led two scientists in our labs, Christoph Chylinski and Martin Jinek, 
to team up and do a series of biochemical experiments showing that the Cas9 protein, which is shown in this cartoon, binds to CRISPR RNAs and locates sequences in double-stranded DNAs, like this uh, cartoon shows, that allows the protein to, uh, to recognize that target site in the DNA, unwind the DNA, and introduce a double-stranded break into the target molecule at sites that are complementary to a 20 nucleotide sequence in the CRISPR transcript, this molecule right here. Now, two remarkable things emerged from these biochemical studies. First of all, as you heard from Emmanuel, a second RNA called tracer is required for this reaction to be, to be functional. And that's because the tracer RNA forms a structure with the end of the CRISPR RNA that is required to bind to Cas9. And secondly, we figured out that there is a requirement for a, a small sequence motif called PAM in the DNA for DNA unwinding. And that's part of the mechanism of the protein, the way it finds correct target sequences in DNA. And that led to uh, a uh, sort of a recognition that this programmable system that could be engineered to recognize different DNA molecules by simply changing this short sequence in the CRISPR RNA could be further engineered, it could be uh, redesigned in a way compared to what nature has done to create a single guide form of the RNA that would include the targeting information and the Cas9 binding information in the same transcript and thereby turn this into a two component system, a single protein and a single guide RNA that could be easily directed to DNA sequences of interest by simply changing the 20 nucleotide sequence in the transcript. And, uh, and so this realization about the mechanism led us to propose this as a technology for genome editing because it had been appreciated for several decades that plant and animal cells have sophisticated machinery for detecting double-stranded breaks in genomic DNA, like I'm showing uh, here in this cartoon. And once those breaks occur, cells can repair these using pathways including non-homologous end joining that lead sometimes to disruption of the DNA sequence during DNA repair or integration of new DNA by a process known as homology-directed repair requiring a donor DNA molecule to be present uh, in the cell. And so scientists recognizing the, the potential to engineer genomes by taking advantage of cellular repair pathways for DNA had been uh, working a way to come up with different mechanisms for introducing double-stranded breaks at desired sites. And the most successful of these had really been the programmable proteins known as zinc finger nucleases and talons and homing endonucleases that are all types of different types of proteins that can be engineered to have very specific DNA binding capabilities. And by coupling those to DNA cleaving domains, one could produce artificial and very specific DNA cleaving enzymes that would induce these kinds of site-specific repair pathways. And so um, these were exciting technologies, but they had never taken off very widely because of the, the uh, required protein engineering to use these for multiple kinds of experiments. In other words, one had to engineer a new protein for every experiment. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if you could use the same protein for every experiment, but uh, simply change the targeting uh, sequence specificity by changing the sequence of the guide RNA. And the way that, that we understand that this, uh, that, the, that this protein operates, Cas9, is by binding to its guide RNA. So I'm showing you here a 3D printed model of a crystallographic structure of the protein. So the protein is in white. It binds to the guide RNA, which is the orange molecule, unwinds double-stranded DNA locally at the site of targeting to create an RNA-DNA hybrid in the center of the protein. And that then allows two active sites in the protein to generate a blunt double-stranded break in the DNA substrate, very precisely. So let me show you a brief video that illustrates how we imagine this bacterial system might function inside of a plant 
or animal cell. Okay, and so we're zooming into a, uh, a plant or animal cell, and you know that in these cells, the DNA is inside the nucleus, and not only that, it's highly packaged. It's wrapped around proteins called histones to form chromatin. And so we know that somehow this bacterial enzyme has to search through the DNA of the cell and deal with this higher order DNA structure to find, in principle, a single site that matches the 20 nucleotide sequence of the guide RNA. And when that occurs, the protein binds to the DNA, unwinds it, forms this transient RNA-DNA hybrid, and then cleaves the double uh, helix of the DNA. And that broken DNA is then handed off to repair enzymes in the cell that repair the break by, in some, some cases, integrating a new DNA sequence, like you saw in that example, to allow incorporation of new genetic information at a site-specific place in the genomic DNA. And so this is technology that's now being utilized for a wide variety of um, cell and whole organism engineering uh, experiments. So why did this technology take off quickly? And I think it really boils down to, to three things. One is that as opposed to older technologies that, that were sort of what I like to call hardwired, you had to make a new protein for every experiment. Uh, here we have a system that's more analogous to software for the cell. The, we have a single protein that can be reprogrammed by changing a sequence of its guiding RNA. Secondly, we, it, this technology came along at a time when there were many opportunities to engineer plant and animal cells due to the availability of genomic sequencing data and an increasing knowledge of the, the function of genes and pathways inside of cells. And as I'll share with you very briefly now, we understand that um, that this protein has evolved in bacteria to have a very rapid and accurate DNA targeting mechanism. So it has fundamental properties that lend themselves to functioning well as a technology. So um, uh, you've you heard a little bit already about this from Emmanuel, but I'll just emphasize that, that the Cas9 protein has turned out to be a, a, a wonderful platform for site-specific DNA targeting because it can be easily modified. So, for example, it's been possible to make forms of this protein that don't cleave DNA but will bind and affect the transcription of genes in a site-specific fashion. It's also possible to make um, chimeras of Cas9, meaning linking this protein to other functional domains that allow uh, fluorescent tagging and uh, opportunities to image particular parts of the genome in living cells and things like that. And the mechanism itself is, uh, is, uh, uh, turns out to be very fast and really quite accurate. So it's been, a, it's been a very useful technology for multiple kinds of applications. So in my own lab, we've wondered how does this bacterial enzyme actually function and furthermore, how does it function inside eukaryotic cells? And I'll just uh, tell you very briefly a couple of things that we've learned uh, over the last few years. So in work that we published in 2014 uh, that included Emmanuel Charpentier as a collaborator, uh, we looked at the structural biology of the Cas9 protein and figured out that this protein rearranges its structure upon binding to RNA in such a way that it opens up a channel for RNA-DNA hybrid formation inside the protein, like I showed you in the 3D printed model. And I want to show you very briefly a movie that illustrates these uh, conformational changes that's based now on a series of crystallographic structures solved in our lab and others that highlight the, the conformational dynamics of this protein. And so this uh, movie, which was made by a student, uh, Ben LaFrance, starts off uh, with Cas9 protein alone, and you'll see it morphing to the structure that it forms as it binds to the guide RNA. So a big structural rearrangement that occurs here in the protein, opening up a channel where the orange guide RNA is able to bind. And then when this RNA protein complex assembles with DNA here in the channel, there's a further conformational change of the protein to accommodate that RNA-DNA hybrid. And then there's a final change in this region right here, which is the, one of the catalytic sites of the enzyme, one of the molecular blades of the protein, that allows it to swing into place so that it's positioned over the target strand of the DNA, the red strand, 
and placed uh, accurately for DNA cleavage. So we think that this enzyme has evolved to have a very accurate mechanism because it samples DNA and changes its conformation only when it is uh, bound to a DNA molecule that has full base pairing complementarity to the guide RNA. So in terms of applications, um, one question that we've been interested in my lab is how do we deliver these molecules into cells or tissues for therapeutic applications or, or frankly, uh, any other kind of, of engineering application that one might envision, such as in plants. And as biochemists, we've been thinking about doing this not uh, in the form of delivering it as a, uh, encoded in DNA or encoded in RNA, but instead as a pre-assembled RNA protein complex that we abbreviate uh, RNP for RNA protein. And the idea is to purify the Cas9 protein, allow it to bind to one or more guide RNAs that are designed to target regions where we'd like to introduce changes in the genome of a cell, and then introduce this into cells using a variety of methods that allow, in some cases, tissue-specific introduction of these complexes into particular kinds of cells. And you could envision that as a therapeutic strategy, this could be highly beneficial if you could ensure that these complexes get into just the cells where you would like to initiate therapeutic uh, genome editing. And so uh, just as an example uh, of this, we've been working on this with colleagues at UC San Francisco Medical School using uh, human immune cells as our target tissue. And we find that we get very rapid editing within just a few hours of introducing this into cells. The half-life of the RNA protein complex is quite short, meaning that any uh, potential off-targeting is minimized. And perhaps most importantly, we can co-deliver DNA templates for recombination and observe much higher rates of incorporation of new DNA at the site of Cas9 targeting than is observed in, in other, with other kinds of delivery methods. And we're using this strategy to uh, make genomic changes in naive human T cells for the purpose of research to understand the uh, developmental pathways of these cells, and we hope ultimately to really uh, use this as a therapeutic strategy to treat human disease. And I just want to end in the last few minutes by um, talking a little bit about thinking about the future. Where is this going? I mean, this is clearly an exciting technology, and it's sort of an exciting moment in biology, really, when many scientists are now using this system for genome editing and a wide range of different kinds of cells and organisms. And the question is, what should we do, what, and what should we perhaps not do using this technology? And I'll briefly mention, and you saw this uh, in Emmanuel's talk, that uh, one of the things that's been very exciting for, for us, I think, over the last few years is to watch the adoption of this technology by laboratories worldwide for a wide range of applications. And I'm listing just some of them here, but in addition to human gene therapy, which you hear a lot about, there's also, I think, very exciting potential to use this for research purposes, including drug discovery, sort of discovering targets of small molecule drugs for uh, controlling vectors in the environment. There's been discussion recently about controlling mosquito populations, for example, that might otherwise be, uh, be uh, in, in infecting people with Zika virus and dengue virus and some of the uh, other sort of dangerous pathogens. We think that uh, there's the potential to use this as uh, the way bacteria do to disrupt viruses in infected cells as well as to um, use it in plant systems and for synthetic biology and maybe also for what I call programmable RNA targeting, something my own lab has been interested in. Can we re-engineer this protein to cleave not DNA molecules but RNA molecules in an RNA programmed fashion? But um, I, you know, as I was involved in the early stages of this work and, and, uh, and, and, and reading uh, the uh, growing number of publications using this technology for various applications, uh, one particular kind of application really uh, caught my attention and that of many others, and that was the idea of using the CRISPR system to modify germ cells. This means to modify cells that are 
uh, are going to develop into whole organisms, and this is showing an example of a needle that is injecting molecules into a fertilized egg. And then if this egg were to be implanted, uh, it could be used to uh, develop into genetically modified animals. And the first example of this that I was personally involved in was work that was done research at UC Berkeley by my colleague in immunology, Russell Vance, who uh, a few weeks after Emmanuel and I um, had, had published some of our initial work, he got excited about this potential of using this in mice, and he got a sample of uh, molecules from us, and then in uh, 2013 was able to show that uh, mice could be modified. And this is an experiment that was done in Russell's lab where they targeted a gene in mice that creates the black coat color in this strain of mice. And the resulting mice that were born, uh, many of them were actually albinos. So these are mice that have had a dual knockout in their genome of the gene required for the black coat color. So this was a really, for me, a really profound sort of moment when I opened up my email and saw this picture because it really underscored in a very visual fashion how this technology can be used for germline editing. And, um, and then it was in uh, early 2014 when uh, a journalist called me in my office at Berkeley to tell me about a paper that was appearing in the journal Cell in which a laboratory had been able to do that kind of germline editing but in monkeys. And this was the moment for me when I really thought that it would be very important to get out in front of the discussion about the possibility of using this in the human germline. And I wondered even at the time whether there might be labs that were already uh, starting to employ this in human embryos. And so this led uh, my, myself and, and a number of colleagues to publish a perspective in, in Science Magazine about a year ago in which we proposed what we called a prudent path forward for uh, genomic engineering, and in particular for modification of the human germline. And we specifically proposed that scientists worldwide refrain from using this technology clinically for human embryo modification due to the ethical uh, issues that arise from that kind of use, as well as the need for further research to really understand how, the, how this technology operates in those kinds of cells. And I've been pleased that this triggered a, a lot of interest globally, and we've had now a series of meetings that are still ongoing in uh, the US and in Europe and now in Asia to discuss this issue and to come, we hope, to a global consensus among scientists, at least, about appropriate uses of this technology. I'm happy to discuss that in the, in the questions, and I'd like to close by acknowledging a large number of people that have contributed to this research. Uh, in our own lab, as well as uh, wonderful collaborators that I uh, certainly mentioned, Emmanuel and, and Christoph, but also uh, folks that have been involved with us both on the mechanistic side, Eric Green at Columbia, Evan Ogallis at Berkeley, and Cy Redding, a student with Eric at Columbia, and then most recently, Alex Marston, who is a clinical doctor of immunology at UC San Francisco. And of course, we could not do anything without funding, and I'd just like to close by emphasizing the importance of fundamental research to the scientific enterprise, because I think none of us can understand, we don't know enough about nature maybe to understand where the next uh, discoveries or technologies are actually going to come from. And the CRISPR system is a, a great uh, example of that. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to address questions. Many thanks. We have time for many questions now. George. Yes, uh, uh, how or why uh, the CAS uh, RNA complex uh, enter easily, or apparently very easily, into the nucleus, goes through the membrane of the nucleus? Uh, how, what, by, how, how does what is it, the mechanism? How does it get across the nuclear membrane? Hmm? Yeah, so it turns out that using established methods for other molecules, we can put what's called a nuclear localization signal on the Cas9 protein, and that can be, it can be engineered genetically into the protein. And then natural mechanisms in the cell will pull it across the nuclear membrane. Now, one thing that we don't understand yet is exactly when it assembles with the guide RNA when that's done, but it, clearly it does because you know it, it gets in and we definitely see um, guided uh, targeting. 
But I, I want to mention something else that's kind of interesting with respect to your question, and that is that we have found recently in our lab that when we use the Cas9 uh, protein RNA complex directly into cells, so we introduce it uh, directly into cells, not encoded in, pro in uh, DNA or RNA, then what we see is that there's no requirement for the nuclear localization signal as long as we allow the cell cycle to proceed. Because during the cell cycle, of course, the nuclear membrane breaks down, and then these molecules get access to the DNA, regardless of whether they have a targeting sequ sequence or not. Sorry, I'm not a biologist, so it's an elementary question. I've missed the point in Dr. Charpentier's, uh, but you would know the answer as well. Uh, take a bacteria, it's simple, invaded by a phage. So in your CRISPR, you would have a, mod a mobile part coming from the phage into the uh, DNA of the bacteria. So this will be transmitted to the next generation, presumably. So the next generation will inherit of some of the history of the parent bacteria. After a few generations, this is an exponential process. So if there is no natural del deletion, this has to stop somewhere. So where does it stop? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question, and, and I, I have to tell you that we don't know the answer. Okay, so, but you're absolutely right that it can't go on forever or it would take over the whole genome, and that doesn't happen. So there is clearly a mechanism that uh, re we think that recombines away the end of these CRISPR loci to remove older uh, viral sequences. And that clearly occurs, one can see evidence for this, but the way it happens is unknown right now. Yeah, but Jennifer, maybe you want to say up to how many sequences we have in this CRISPR. Yeah, so, uh, we so have many, many. Uh -huh. Yeah, so. Yeah, but exponential or fast. <laughs> no, but, uh, but it's a wide range. So some of these CRISPR elements are only one unit in length, and some are many dozens. So it, there's a wide range of sizes. Yeah. I would like to come back to the problem of editing the human genome. Because I remember reading a paper from a Chinese group who has uh, tried to do that with eggs which were not going to be able to survive anyway because they had two spermatozoa. But anyway, they tried, and they found that, uh, that it was not very specific. The problem was not, no specificity. So the idea of this guy who did that was to, uh, to, to say to the people not to do it before specificity would be, would be better. Yeah, so uh, I would say a, a couple of thoughts about that. One is that I think that uh, it's very hard to draw conclusions about what would happen in viable human embryos based on what's going on in non-viable embryos because these are clearly not normal, normally developing embryos. And so whether DNA repair pathways would be functioning the same way that they do in a viable embryo, you know, we don't know. Secondly, the way that the, that laboratory introduced the Cas9 system into the cells was uh, known to be prone to off-targeting. And the reason is that these uh, Cas9 molecules were being highly overexpressed in the cells. They were present in vast excess over the amount necessary for editing. And of course, if you have many, many of these molecules, then you're going to have a higher incidence of off-targeting for that reason. Another problem, uh, the, the, this editing has, has been done certainly in human cells in culture. And in this case, what, what was the result as far as uh, specificity is concerned? Yeah, so what's been seen in human cells in culture regarding specificity is that when labs have used, uh, have used primary cells, so not, not cancer cells that have typically have uh, you know, many copies of chromosomes and perhaps aberrant DNA repair pathways for that, you know, for, for the, in those cells. When, when labs use primary cells, the accuracy is quite high. And I'll give you an example. So uh, I, I'm recently reviewing some data that Hans Klevers in the Netherlands was showing uh, using organoids. So what his lab does is to use uh, stem cells from humans to create small organ-like tissues in, uh, in a test situation in, in the laboratory. And when they use Cas9 in those cells, they see really no evidence for off-targeting, even when they do whole genome sequencing. 
So I think that you know, when used in appropriate amounts and in primary cells that have normal repair pathways, the evidence for off-targeting is very low. Thank you. Do, you. do you have a mic or not? No, but speak up. We are taking questions for people below 35. OK. <laughs> Good. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I do have a question about the um, adaptive phase of the system. Um, is there any regulation mechanism that avoid um, um, adaptive cas protein to pick spacer from the genome of the bacteria or anything like that? Yeah, so he's asking uh, when new sequences are integrated into the CRISPR locus yeah. uh, during the adaptive phase of mm -hmm. the pathway, is there a mechanism that avoids integrating sequences from the, the host's chromosome, which would obviously be uh, very bad, suicidal perhaps? Um, and, and the answer is that uh, it, it's not entirely clear if there is a mechanism that specifically avoids those kinds of integration events or whether in bacteria you integrate whatever's available and the cells that inherit a, a, you know, a useful piece of DNA are the ones that survive, right, so. Daniel Louvain. Yeah, great talk. I think you, you beautifully show in your movie that uh, the Cas protein has to interact directly with the double helix. In the case of eukaryotic cells, beside of the accessibility in nucleus, which I think is not a major problem, how do you overcome the chromatin structure and epigenetic marks for a given gene that you want to change whatever? Yeah. No, it's a great question. I mean, you know, we now know that, uh, that there's obviously a lot of higher order organization of DNA in the nucleus, um, neighborhoods, for example, that um, involve localization of particular parts of the genome to various places in the nucleus, and, um, and also areas of the genome that are much more highly compacted than, than others. And yet somehow this bacterial protein seems to gain access to, to those sites, uh, not, I would say not with equal efficiency, but with sufficient efficiency that you can basically get editing events at, uh, you know, sites uh, that, you're, that, that are desired. And um, how that really works, I would say, is still not entirely clear, but I didn't have time to show you that some recent uh, experiments that we've been doing with uh, colleagues, including Bob Tejan at Berkeley and uh, uh, some uh, scientists at the Genelia Research Campus in, in Washington, D.C., using, hot, using uh, super resolution microscopy, allows us to visualize fluorescently labeled Cas9 proteins as they're searching through a genome. And what we see in those experiments is that this protein has incredibly fast kinetics. So it looks like it binds and releases DNA very, very quickly. And we think that that is part of the explanation for its targeting capabilities. In other words, we think it probably takes advantage of very transient dynamics in chromatin structure that allow it to gain access to sites that would normally be occluded. Now, I don't have direct evidence for that, but that's our current working model. Uh, two short questions. First, you did propose a moratorium uh, to be prudent, akin to the asyloma moratorium. Uh, how, what is the momentum behind, behind this idea? What, what, how is it going forward at the moment? And second, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the impact on synthetic biology and uh, artificial genomes and f five bases genomes and whatever? <laughs> Sure. So um, Emmanuel and I were both part of an international summit that was held in December in Washington to examine the question in particular of the use of genome editing in human embryos. And the result of that was a consensus statement released after the meeting in which we proposed, we didn't use the word moratorium, but it was definitely a proposal that any clinical application of this technology in embryos not proceed at this time. And by clinical application, we meant any uh, use of this to create a genetically modified baby um, while preserving the ability of scientists to conduct research in those types of cells in accordance with guidelines existent in their own country of origin. And um, I think that that uh, consensus statement has triggered a lot of interest uh, in, in, the, in the public sectors. I think that I've been very pleased that governments around the world have been getting actively involved in 
learning about this technology, examining whether additional regulatory measures are, are necessary. And those are the conversations that need to happen. So I think the, the, the progress there is, is, is very, um, is very uh, uh, encouraging. And I think it will, uh, we hope, support the ability of scientists to continue to conduct appropriate research, but without getting ahead of ourselves in the use of the technology. And then to your second question about synthetic biology, incredibly exciting time right now with this. I think it's very exciting. I'm glad you asked that question because you know people often focus on the use of this for human therapies, which is you know a great thing. But I think there are equally exciting opportunities to have a real impact on human society. Um, in, in uh, organisms that are valuable for producing biofuels, for producing uh, what we call green chemicals. There's an active uh, team in the Bay Area of San Francisco, for example, that is using this in yeasts that have traditionally not been genetically tractable but are critically important for industrially. And now with Cas9, we can use this system to introduce new genes for pathways that uh, will make uh, useful molecules. So I think there's a really exciting opportunity Going forward, you know, using uh, synthetic genomes and being able to use that method as well as site-specific editing to really very precisely engineer pathways into organisms or maybe even engineer whole, uh, whole organisms with their you know, de desired genomes. I think it's a, a really exciting time and again requires uh, appropriate consideration and, and careful use. Pascal. Uh, I would like to know uh, what you think about modifying plants by this system. Do you call them uh, GMOs or not? Well, it depends on whether I'm in Europe or I'm in the U.S. <laughs> and I'm in Europe right now, so uh, maybe, maybe we would call them GMOs. But, um, but no, it's an interesting point because in Europe, and you may all know this, in Europe, the definition of a genetically modified organism stems from the, type, the, the way that those organisms were treated. So if I've used a genome modification uh, mechanism like this one here in a plant uh, to produce a plant that in the end has no foreign DNA in it, uh, in Europe, this would be called a genetically modified plant. In the US, not, okay? The U.S. Department of Agriculture recently declared that any plant engineered using Cas9 that in the end had no foreign DNA in that plant would not be considered GMO in the U.S. Okay, so, you know, we have to, uh, <laughs> we have to grapple with these definitions. And, um, but I think that it's, it's an interesting point because one of the things that I'm really, really excited about right now is the opportunities in plants. I think that in addition to opportunities in crop plants, we have an opportunity to do research in plants that have in the past been genetically intractable, as well as to use this to solve problems that are, are sort of, again, seemingly intractable by other methods. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, in, in, the, in the sort of North America, the Dutch elm was a beautiful tree that, uh, that uh, sort of went away when a fungus came uh, into the environment that wiped them out. And we've been discussing with our forestry department at Berkeley, what if we could actually engineer a new kind of Dutch elm that was protected against this fungus? It might be an interesting opportunity. So, you know, I think there are, are things of that nature that one could think about doing that might have a very positive impact in the environment. There is a question by a young lady below 35, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just have a technical question about the, the CRISPR system when we use it as a uh, genetic tool. Um, as the CRISP, uh, as the Cas9 actually cuts uh, with a double strand break, uh, how can we be sure that it is uh, efficient enough? I mean, because as the, the two uh, strands are cut, it, uh, it's possible that it uh, pastes again or that uh, something else is introduced. I was just wondering about the efficiency. Is it efficient enough or actually using like a paired, you know, Nikas that just cuts one uh, strand, so using two, is it more uh, specific to have like a non-homologous end, end joining? I was wondering about. Yeah, so um, this is an enzyme that has evolved naturally to, to make double-stranded DNA breaks, as we discussed. It can also be engineered to make only one cut in DNA, so make a nick, right? And so early on, there were some papers published using the nickase version of Cas9, and there, the idea was to require two separate binding and cleavage events in DNA that might in, 
might make the system more specific. Those have not been adopted by, by laboratories. And why is that? They're not necessary. And the reason is that intrinsically, this protein has a very accurate way of detecting target sites and discriminating them from off-target sites and only cutting DNA molecules that have a cognate match to the guide RNA. And I didn't have time to go through all, the, all of the data with you on that, but there's many papers now published on this. And I think that's just something that, you know, we couldn't have predicted this uh, in our original uh, research, but I think that it's, a, it's just an intrinsic property of this protein that turns out to be highly useful as a technology. Please. The young, well, let's go, go ahead. <laughs> um, my question is a little bit naive. Have you looked for the system in, uh, in, in pathogen or in bacteria that are in harsh environments, such as thermophiles or uh, acidic, and if so, is the mechanism conserved, or is the specificity for the PAM sequence altered? Yes. Well, funny that you should ask that. So in our own lab, we've been working on Cas9s that are derived from both kinds of organisms, acidophiles and thermophiles. And what we find is that the fundamental mechanism is highly conserved. Uh, the PAM sequences are different. As Emmanuel said, you know, bacteria have evolved a wide range of these enzymes, and they have different PAM specificities, which I think in the end will be you know, useful uh, technologically, and also we think it'll be interesting mechanistically to study those. And we're, we're interested in those two types of Cas9s in particular, and maybe this is what you're alluding to, but for acidophiles, would those enzymes be able to function in a more acidic environment? So if you were delivering them into uh, eukaryotic cells by a, um, a pathway involving endocytosis, then you might be able to survive the acidic environment of the endosome better if you are, a, you know, if, if this protein has evolved in an acidophile. That's one idea. And for the thermophiles, we think that it could be very useful to have thermally stable forms of this protein that might um, allow them to operate in environments uh, or parts of the cell even where they would otherwise not be very active or would be degraded. Um, I was wondering, like you showed in your presentation that in the CRISPR system, uh, you highlighted the importance of having a white RNA that is single-stranded. However, regarding the propensity of RNA to fall in secondary structure, is there some associated molecular mechanism that ensure that the RNA is single-stranded? Well, um, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's a good point because, you know, our, we, we have seen, and this was work that we did in collaboration with Barbara Meyer's lab at UC Berkeley, that uh, you know, she was using a lot of the, uh, the, the, the Cas9 proteins and, and guide RNAs that we were generating in the lab to target sequences in C. elegans. And, and there, in this worm system, they found that a number of the guides uh, didn't seem to work very well. And we found that, that in some cases, at least, those guides are, are misfolded. So they, uh, they, they just don't seem to assemble efficiently with the protein. So it is, a, it is one thing that people have to think about when they're using the system is to design guide RNAs that don't have intrinsic secondary structure that might occlude Cas9 binding. What is your... Then there will be a general discussion <laughs> and you can ask questions to both... Uh, uh, what, what is your opinion on both, actually, on engineering and releasing in the wild gene drives, in particular with respect to the consequences? Yeah, I think we have to proceed with... Oh, yes, uh, he's asking about um, the use of a Cas9 or really any genome editing system to create what are called gene drives, meaning using, taking advantage of the highly efficient genome editing capabilities of a system like this to introduce a gene into a, an organism in a fashion where it could then be spread very quickly through a population. And there's already been a lot of discussion about this, in particular, uh, the idea of using such a strategy to sterilize mosquitoes or make them impervious to infection by pathogens so that we could uh, control the spread of a virus like Zika, for example. And I, on the one hand, I think, it's a, you know, I think it's a really exciting possibility to use this if it could be done in a way that uh, is controllable. So I would be in favor of uh, proceeding with real caution there because we don't want to do something that is going to quickly change 
uh, the ecological balance uh, by wiping out a species, even if it seems like a good idea to get rid of mosquitoes, perhaps. But um, you know, but I think that uh, that uh, the work of George Church and Kevin Esvelt in particular have been very vocal about this. And I think the idea right now that scientists are working on is how to have controllable Cas9s that can be turned off, where you could have an off switch in the event that um, you wanted to deactivate a, a gene drive like that. But that's very much work still in progress, I would say.